All right, hey everyone, let's go ahead and get started. Um, our talk is uh, taking Google Cloud Platform and Android for a spin. Whoops, let me. Uh, um, so who I am? Who am I? My name is Brett McGowan. I'm a developer advocate for Google. Uh, working on the, the Google Cloud Platform. So um, I'm, we represent cloud. It's not quite Android, but you'll see there's some nice there's some nice overlap here uh, that I think you'll be interested when we talk about this project. Um, I'm based here in the New York office down in Chelsea. Uh, even though I'm in the New York office, I am from Texas. That is my hat. Um, how do you know if someone is from Texas? They will tell you. Exactly. That's how you know someone's from Texas. Uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at @bredmcg. And this is Ray. Hello, guys. I'm my, my name's Ray. I'm also a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. I'm also based here in New York City, but I get to travel a lot, uh, so I'm actually not here most of the time. So I'm actually very happy to be here today. Uh, I just got back from a two-week trip in Asia. I went to Indonesia, Malaysia, and Taiwan. Just came back yesterday, yesterday morning, get everything set up here today. So yeah, it's been exhausting. So if I look a little tired, that's not entirely my own fault. Um, and we're a developer advocate, so what we do is actually we want to bring some of the latest and greatest technology to you, and we also want to hear uh, feedback from all of you in terms of how you like our products, and also if you are using any cloud, if you have any experiences, feel free to let us know. And um, that's my Twitter handle, it's Satanism. It's actually not my name, uh, but it actually has a meaning. Who actually knows what that word means? That's the one best way to memorize my, uh, my Twitter handle. It actually means lead poisoning. But that's not why I chose it. I, I, I chose it because I like Saturn as a planet. And I love to take photos. That's why I'm always behind the camera. But if you take another camera away, um, I'm still behind the camera. That's because I'm kind of shy. All right? Cool. So uh, we have a project called CloudSpin. And you might have seen it down in the, uh, in the exhibit hall down there. We've got like a bunch of Android phones in, in, a, in a row. And this came up because we wanted to show off the power of the cloud. We wanted to do it in a way that was a little more interesting than us just kind of putting like some bullet points up in here a slide and walking through some features of like, oh, you know, we have App Engine, it does this. We wanted to make it fun, we want to make it interesting, and we wanted to build something and walk you through how we built it so that you can see uh, what technologies we use in the cloud and why it made sense. So this is fun because I always wanted to have a startup. Well. Technically, I had a startup. I wanted to have a startup that actually made something that launched. And this was my chance. So um, we had three weeks. Much like a startup, we had to get something out the door that did something in three weeks. So um, to that end, we wanted to do things as much off the shelf as possible. So um, as you see down there, we're using Android phones. We wanted to not worry as much about infrastructure and scaling. We kind of just wanted our code to just run, right? We want to spend most of our time working on code. We want to be as productive as possible. So we thought, OK, what, what project could we do that would be cool that we could do in three weeks and we could pretend to be a startup? Again, this is the story that we're going to tell. So we thought, all right, oh, I know photo booths. Like, you guys know photo booths. They have them like, in malls and like weddings and bar mitzvahs and things. And um, sometimes they have like, zany props. So it's like two people will get sunglasses. Well, two people. If you're like me and my friends, you put like 20 people in there and like one person's like up against the, the camera and like they're just crammed in there with like Viking helmets and giant sunglasses and like feather boas and all this crazy stuff. So we thought, what if we like, you know, our fake startup, we're going to revolutionize that industry for the photo booth industry. So instead of a, a little strip of paper you get out that has your friend's pictures, like what if we did something like this? Like what if we did a cool frozen in time, 180 degree rotating video? Now that would be a kind of a really fun way to show off the power of the cloud and uh, give you something to kind of take home with you. So this was our idea to do this. Um, so we are engineers, so this is our engineering diagram. There's y'all, there's like math and everything on this. We had to use angles and I had to remember what a radius was. Um, so this, this is the engineering diagram. What I'm about to show you is what when you send this to marketing, this was what marketing came back with. Yeah, there's not a single number in this whole diagram. But it looks cool. And if you look downstairs, it actually ended up kind of looking a lot like that. Uh, so how does it work? So the basic idea um, is you've got this row of, of cameras, of Android phones, in a circle. The user sits in the middle. They jump, or they throw something in the air, or they do some kind of crazy pose. And each camera takes a picture at the exact same moment in time. Then we'll stitch those all together so it'll be like a rotating video. So that's the idea. So it sounds really easy, right? Right? So be short talk. 
Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's actually not that easy. It was actually really, really hard. And there are actually two things that make it especially difficult. But first of all, we need to coordinate 19 phones, 19 phones, and have them to take a photo at exactly the same moment. Because if you're jumping up in the mid-air, you're moving quite fast, and um, every photo can only be about 20 milliseconds apart, okay? But the problem is that in the Android API, when you're trying to use the camera API, when you want to take the photo, you tell the, photo, you tell the API to take a photo, but it's asynchronous. So you actually don't know when the photo is actually going to be taken. There's this random delay that we actually don't know about. And if you apply this random delay to all of the 19 phones, what that actually means is every single phone could be taking a photo at a different time, and they're not exactly the same moment in time. So that actually tells us that it's actually quite impossible to take a photo at the same time from all 19 cameras. In fact, that's what they tell us, that's they, what the, our team told us, like that's gonna be really difficult, I don't know how you guys are going to figure this out, and that makes many, many sad faces. Um, and we're, we're really worried about this, but we're able to solve this, um, but how would you actually do this if you were to uh, try to do this project yourself? Any ideas? Shout, yes, there's one person. Right, yeah. So if you take a rapid shot, if you use, for example, if you use a burst mode to take a number of photos at the same time, and in like a second, you can probably get up to 30 frames per second. But the problem is you still have to kind of figure out which of those frames is going to be aligning with all the other frames that's being taken from all of the other, other camera. So we actually had a, a, another idea uh, very similar to that. What we ended up doing is by taking a video. And that's, so Brett actually found one of my videos and uh, he, he changed it to an animated GIF, which is kind of annoying for me to see all the time. But you're stuck with it until I'm done with the slide. But we're kind of, so what we end up doing is uh, we're recording a video from every single phone and that's effectively acting like a 30 frame per second in burst mode, right? Um, but it also gives us uh, a, a different benefit. And we're recording about eight, second, eight seconds of video from each phone so that we're pretty sure that there's going to be overlapping frames from every single phone. Okay. But the problem is, even we, if we have 30 frames per second and we have eight seconds of it, how do we actually identify the frame of myself that's jumping into the midair? Because we want the best moment. We want the moment where I'm actually in the midair hanging so that it looks like almost like metrics, right? So how, how do we actually do it? Um, we thought about many, many things uh, to kind of identify a frame in that video from all 19 different videos. So we thought about using computer vision, for example, to kind of analyze the video stream and kind of figure out when I'm actually jumping in the midair. But unfortunately, none of us are computer vision scientists. So we actually don't know how to do that. It's also very, very complicated because we only have about three weeks to do it. So we thought about other easier way, for example, using a flash. So it's like taking a photo. When I'm jumping the midair, I can like trigger a flash and kind of brighten up the scene a little bit and then I can actually identify it. Uh, we tried that too, but that didn't work so well because the lighting condition is really, really hard to, to, to handle. Uh, the other things we thought about is by using timestamp, and the problem with that is every single phone could be off by a little bit, and we actually don't know how to get the accurate timestamp from the video itself, and also getting it from the frames from the video. Okay, so what we ended up doing is by using an audio marker. Now, if you know about moving industry, you probably know that they probably use the, the, the clapperboard, right? So before they start, they, they're like ready, set, action, and then they clap, and that audio marker and also the visual signal actually helps them to kind of identify the synchronization point between different videos. So that's what we're doing. So we're sending this audio marker to all of the video stream to, at the same time to identify that frame when they're jumping in the midair. But that's also a little challenging because at the first, in the prototyping phase, we were just having people to jump and then they shout like, hey, like something really, really loud. And then you can actually record that as part of the video. And, and then we can identify uh, that sound uh, in the video in the sound stream. But the problem is like in a, in a um, condition like this in the conference environment in the exhibition hall, it's really, really noisy, right? So what happens then is we actually have to feed the audio signal directly into each of the devices that we have. But that's also very difficult because I don't know how many people actually had Android phone and iPhone at the same time many, many years ago where if you have a headset, uh, a headset jack uh, with a mic, if you plug it into Android phone, it works, but if you plug it into uh, iOS or iPhones, it probably doesn't work. Um, I don't know how many people actually had experienced that. I had experienced that myself. Well, there's one person, yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. Uh, but there's a reason behind it. Uh, it's because there are actually two different standards in the jack itself. So that's a very typical 
jack that goes into the phone, you can see that the top rings are the left audio signal and the right audio signal. But the third and the fourth are flipped between the two standards. One of the rings is a mic, the other one's the ground. And because the other standard flips over, so that's why the jack only works on one phone but not the other. But once we figured this out, everything was a little bit easier. Well, not really, because we actually have to split the signal to 19 different devices. So somebody from the Android engineering team actually drew us the schema so we can actually build our custom device and custom cable that will split an audio signal into 19 devices with resistors and everything else. Unfortunately, again, none of us were double E majors either. So we actually don't know how to build this. But fortunately, at Google, many people do. So one of our colleagues actually you know, bought a bunch of uh, components in breadboard and resistors, and he tried to build this for, our, for us. And so he built this really, really nice box with like one input and 19 outputs, so we can actually plug them in into different devices. Um, but just up until the last day uh, before our final presentation of this, uh, this device actually did not work. <laughs> so what we ended up doing is we actually used off the shelf components. We could have actually bought all the cables and all of the adapters from like Adorama or BNH or some or from Amazon. So we bought everything uh, and then we connected them all together. And in the end, we kind of were able to record a video like this. And if I turn on the sound, oh, there's no sound. Well, let's try it. Can you guys hear it? Beep. Well, now you heard it. So, <laughs> so basically, the, if the sound is actually going through, you are going to hear like a little beep as I was jumping up in the midair, and that's how we are going to be identifying the frame. Okay. Oh, let me uh, go to the next slide. So we know how to actually record the video from a single camera, but we have to take this and coordinate all of the 19 cameras to take the video at the same time. So how do we actually do it, Brett? Um, all right. So how do we coordinate 19 phone cameras? Wait, no, seriously, how do we coordinate it? That sounds complicated. Um, that's a lot of data we've got to move around in a very short period of time. So we said, all right, let's take a step back. Uh, and the first question we'll ask ourselves is, what, what exactly do we need to send around flying amongst all the phones and maybe it's some kind of coordinating app or like a reporting tool or whatever? Or like, what, what data do we need? So uh, camera status, so this would be camera is uh, offline, it's online, it's taking a video, it's uploading a video, whatever different status is. Uh, God forbid we get an error message of some kind, which I don't think we've ever had, right? No? No. no. Uh, um, we need to know what that error message is um, without having to like physically go to each phone. We want it to report out. Um, so we, uh, exposure, ISO and shutter speed is important because we've actually taken this to uh, a bunch of places, literally around the world. So uh, Tokyo, Amsterdam, London, uh, New York, San Francisco, New Jersey, um, you know, all, all Washington DC, Boston, yeah. So. Um, very different lighting conditions in all those places. Uh, in Amsterdam, we were basically like in a cave. There was like, it was almost pitch black, it was so dark. And in London, we were basically outside in the middle of the day. So like two very different lighting conditions. Um, so as we're like playing with all those exposure settings, we don't, we don't have to recompile our APK and like redeploy it to all of our phones, 19 at a time, like unplugging and plugging, or even if we did over USB, uh, or sorry, over Wi-Fi, like it's still a pain in the ass. So. Uh, we want to be able to set those settings and send them instantaneously to all the phones so they can update right away. In, um, we need to know if it's using an internal mic versus external mic. So like Ray talked about, we're using an audio signal. So we want to use an external mic uh, to, to, to feed into the headphone jack because we essentially want it to be nice and quiet. So when that beep happens, it's just a very clear peak, right? Like, so if we have a lot of noise, we don't want to have any, any ambient noise. We want to control. Uh, the amount of noise that's coming in. So we need to know if someone accidentally pops the headphone, uh, head, the cable out of the headset jack, we want to know right away. Um, and then the timestamp to, to start recording. So this would be, you know, the now when the guy jumps in the air or something to that effect. So we used, Fair we used Firebase. Um, Firebase is great. Uh, Firebase is a Google company. Um, they, they actually have their own booth downstairs. So like go talk to those guys. Um, it's a great, great, great. Uh, piece of technology, I highly encourage you to check it out if you're not familiar with it. Um, so one of the things it can do that we used it for is it just works like a NoSQL database that very, very quickly will update all the subscribers that are listening to a piece of data uh, essentially in real time, so in the order of milliseconds. So this is really good for us. So I can say, uh, for example, I want to change my shutter speed click and, and you can literally see like instantly uh, all, the, all the cameras change. So that's really nice because Firebase 
uh, is a hosted managed service. We don't have to stand up any servers. We don't have to worry about like how much RAM do we need, like what kind of CPU. Oh man, I forgot to update my like to the latest Ubuntu, whatever. Like Firebase is a completely managed service, uh, and it's great. And actually, for a non-trivial amount of apps. Uh, uh, it has an Android SDK, iOS SDK, and a web SDK. For a non-trivial amount of apps, you actually can get away with having no back-end code like, whatsoever and have 100% of your code be in your app. Um, and you guys are all here at DroidCon, so like, that's probably pretty appealing. Like, I want to live in Android Studio or Eclipse or whatever building my app. So, uh, so we decided to use Android Studio. I mean, uh, pfft, we did definitely use Android Studio, uh, uh, Firebase. Um, and it's super easy. So here's a peek at some of the code. I don't know if you guys can read it, but essentially, Where's my little green pointer thing? Uh, you can't see it. Um, so we just get a reference to Firebase, that very first line. And then all the rest of it is, uh, the second line is pointing to a URL. Uh, you're defining like um, the URL format. So we want to like, slash camera, slash camera number, uh, where this data is going to live. Because it also, also Firebase will create a REST uh, endpoint for you automatically. So you can fetch the data from any system, which is nice. But the rest is just uh, a plain old Java object. So we're just creating an object, setting properties. And then the last line is set value. So when we do that, the camera uh, is reporting its value up to Firebase. And again, within milliseconds, every other camera knows the status of that. Our control tablet knows the status. Um, our visualizer knows the status, like really quickly, without, and, and literally, this is the only code. Like there is no, like, uh, there is no code to say, take this data and push it out. Uh, it does it for us, which is nice. So here's a shot of what the app looks like um, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So the green is ready. So these are 19 ready bars. Uh, so these, every camera here is reporting its status, uh, its app version, so 1.05. Um, again, as we're iterating on it, like we wanted to know, like, whoops, we forgot to upgrade like phone 7. Um, that's why it's misbehaving, because of the weird version. And then if someone unplugs it, external mic will flip to internal mic, and it'll go red. So we'll know right away, like, whoa, whoa, hold up, like we need to fix something. Um, all right, so on the right is a shot into Firebase of like what this data is. So you can see there's like the camera, uh, Exposure, sensitivity. So I've circled here uh, start countdown with an eight. And so that is basically give us an eight second countdown from when I hit that button. And the way that that works, when I hit start countdown on our control tablet, it takes the current time, adds eight seconds, and then writes it uh, into Firebase. So it's going to update this timestamp. And every phone that we have is watching this value. So within milliseconds, again, Firebase will send that to, to all of the Android phones. And they'll say, aha, as of this time, like, I need to be recording a video already. So uh, the way we do that is we say, all right, when this time is about to happen, we're going to start recording about two seconds before that, so that when this timestamp comes, we can be guaranteed that we're already recording a video. Once all the cameras are recording, and we can see that because our uh, visualizer will, will turn blue instead of green for all those phones, then we'll hit this. I didn't put a red circle on it, sorry. But there's a, uh, a giant take photo button there. So you hit the take photo button, and that will actually play the audio tone that goes out into uh, um, a splitter. It splits it 19 ways and goes into the headphone jack of every, of every phone. So that's how that works. Um, so how did I record the video? What code did I use? Um, I used what we call copy uh, and uh, uh, paste. Yeah, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, no, but seriously, there's a, the Camera 2 video project is on GitHub. It's put out by the Android team. It is a fantastic way to learn how to use the Camera 2 API. So uh, we used it both for um, taking still photos, burst mode, and then ultimately for taking video. So it was really nice. Like I, I almost just copied and pasted uh, a ton of it. So that's a little embarrassing because I like to pretend that I had some super brilliant algorithm. But uh, again, we had three weeks, and we're a startup. That's what we're going to do. We're going to copy and paste code. All right, so we were a geographically distributed team. Um, so Ray and I are here in New York. We had a colleague, Francesc, in California, and then a colleague, Kathy, in Seattle. And Ray and I were focusing on kind of the Android and the hardware side of things here in New York. So there's a giant Android logo. In fact, we actually kind of had a little secret startup lab. Uh, we were not even in the main Google building. Um, there was a building that no one I even talked to even knew like Google owned. Um, I won't tell you where it is because it's our secret startup lab. Um, it's actually not secret. It's just a random building, but no one had heard of it. But it's kind of cool because it actually made it felt like, oh, we are a startup. Like We've got three weeks. Like, we're cranking on this. Like We've got our own studio space uh, uh, to get this together. So we, uh, again, like a startup, we wanted to be scrappy. We wanted to be off the shelf. Also, our goal for this is that someday, like we're going to open source this code at some point. Once I do it, um, <laughs> um, 
is for people to just be able to, to get like 10 or 12 like friends together, put the app on everyone's phone, and kind of set up your own like matrix style photo booth. So um, we didn't want to use any specialized hardware. So to that end, we used like all purely off the shelf stuff. So we were really scrappy, like, like really scrappy. So in this uh, picture on the left, we didn't have any measuring tape. Um, I know Google's like a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar company and like we don't have measuring tape. But for some reason, Ray had crime scene tape at his desk. Like, I don't, no I, yeah, I don't exactly know what that was. Um, so we were trying to find the ideal distance. Uh, we did find out that the best distance is seven cautions. So in case you find yourself in a similar situation, just measure out seven cautions and you'll be good. Uh, on the right, uh, these are selfie sticks, which is literally the least stable way you can hold up uh, a half pound Nexus phone it is really bad. So I can't tell you how many times I would like roll my desk, uh, my chair across the floor to go talk to Ray, and then just just the breeze would essentially topple this thing. We'd go diving under the floor and like pick it up. Um, knock on wood, knock on plastic. Um, so far, we haven't dropped a single phone, but we had a lot of close calls with those dang selfie sticks. Um, yeah. So needless to say, we eventually upgraded uh, to like a real tripod. Um, so this is our intern Matt. Um, so he is he has gone back to school, I think. Um, but uh, here he is. We were trying to figure out how to work this light. Um, none of us are lighting experts. So Matt's a smart guy. He actually wrote the first version of our frame extraction code. So he's a smart, smart guy. Um, but we could not figure out how to get this light to turn on. Um, later, looking at this photo, I would realize it's unplugged. You can see the plug like right there. <laughs> um, all right. So. Once we got tired of selfie sticks, we upgraded to like real tripods. So these are actual camera tripods, and we got little adapters so we could put the cell phone on top um, to, do, to do our first prototype. So the thing that we have downstairs is like a big fancy thing that like some company made for us. But before we could like have them do that, we wanted to make sure that this like really worked. So, uh, so we got these tripods. Incidentally, we have a green screen, and everyone would be like, oh, you're doing something cool with a green screen? And we were like, no, that was just the color of the thing that came with the lights. So. <laughs> No, no, like superimposed video or anything. Um, this has nothing to do with the project, except this creepy lady was in the bathroom in our like in our secret other other office. So every time I had to pee, like she was like staring at me, and that's like kind of creepy, right? But what's really creepy is someone had cut her eyes out, and behind her eyes are more eyes. <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh my god! I just I don't know why I felt like I didn't tell you guys that, but this this like kind of scarred me from this project, like. At first, I thought it was like a Scooby-Doo situation where there's like someone is like looking like in through the bathroom, but I don't know what that was. Anyway, let's move on. It's pretty pretty scary. <laughs> I mean, I can stay on this slide if you guys want me to, but probably not. Um, all right, so we built our prototype. We have real tripods. They're all taking video. Everything is good. So now we need to actually we want to upload this stuff all to the cloud so that it can take care of processing all the video and extracting all the frames and doing all that stuff. And we also put it in the cloud so that we can scale uh, as as big as we want. So you know, in our fake world with our fake startup, we're going to have thousands of these things across the world, and we need to know how do we structure our cloud uh, infrastructure so that it'll scale automatically. So that sounds really hard. So Ray, how did we do that? That's a, that's a really, really good question. In fact, it's so good that uh, the thing that we did is we just handed off to our colleague in San Francisco, to Francesc. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so Francesc is going to figure this out for us. And in fact, he had. Uh, he's the person who actually wrote most of the backend code in the cloud for us. And uh, so Francesc taught us everything that he did. I'm going to tell you what we actually did. So this is the backend uh, architecture diagram of what happens after we have taken the video. So on the left-hand side are these devices that we have in the semicircle. And once the video has been uh, recorded, we actually upload it into the cloud into like a bucket storage. Now, if you're uh, familiar with some of the cloud providers, uh, every cloud pro provider has some kind of storage uh, that you can use. And for us, we upload it to what we call Google Cloud Storage. And it's a bucket storage where you can actually store a lot of data. Each one of these videos is about 9 megabyte or to 10 megabyte large. And with 19 of them, that's about 190 megabytes that needs to be uploaded uh, for every one of these sessions that we're taking. And once the video is uploaded, we send it through a notification processor, and then we will, oh, there we go. And then we send it through this uh, uh, processing pipeline where we're going to you know, look at the video, extract the, extract the frame to see where the, uh, the audio beep is, where the audio signal is happening, which you can actually see in the graph here, like there's this little bump in terms of uh, audio strength. And then the extractor process is actually going to identify that audio beep and then extract the frame that's associated with that audio beep. 
and that's how we identify the frame. And then we're going to send all of the frames uh, up to the stitcher, uh, which is over there. And uh, the stitcher is going to get every single frame from all of the different video that we have recorded. And finally, we're going to stitch them together, and then we're going to send it to the output bucket um, for, uh, for people to see it. So how do we actually upload the video? Uh, well, there are many different um, uh, ways for you to store data in Google Cloud Platform. We have something we call Cloud Data Store, Cloud SQL, and Cloud Storage. Now, the easiest way to remember uh, one of these things is that Cloud Data Store is our NoSQL database. Okay? It's, it's how we actually store many of our data internally. It's the same technology that we use. In fact, we store up to 4.5 trillion like, transactions per month. That's how good this is. And it's just, you don't actually have to worry about the back end. There's nothing you have to manage. Everything's managed by us. No matter how much data that you have that you need to store, uh, it will just scale out for you automatically. And there's no, no management that's necessary on your part. Uh, Cloud SQL is just another uh, way of us for manage the MySQL instances for you, so you can store uh, just SQL database information. Now, for cloud storage, uh, basically, it's just a way for you to store many cat videos. Um, it basically, it's a, a it's a bucket store uh, where you can or object store where you can just store large amount of data uh, or files up to like terabytes per file if you want to, and um, and you don't have again you don't have to worry about the backing infrastructure. Now, in the Android code, though, uh, for you to connect and store uh, data into the uh, cloud storage, th which is what we're using to store the video, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Well, first of all, uh, you have to get the credential, which, which we use at OAuth to authentication. And then you kind of build out this uh, storage uh, object, which you can later use to basically get the input stream from the file. And then you can associate it with, it, with a, a metadata or the um, uh, the video slash mp4, the content type, and then all you have to do is just to insert the object into like a directory. And once you have done that, once you upload the, the file into uh, cloud storage, uh, what's really nice about this is that, you know, normally people will actually have on the client side make another call to the server to tell the server that something has been uploaded, right? Now with Google Cloud Storage, basically there's this uh, feature called object change notification. What that means is whenever you make a change to the object or whenever you upload a new file, Cloud Storage can actually trigger a webhook for you behind the scenes automatically. Okay, so here, when we upload the video uh, into the storage bucket, uh, it's going to actually trigger an object change notification uh, by calling a webhook which you are hosting on App Engine. Now App Engine is a platform as a service that we have that you can basically just write the code in either Java, Python, Go, or PHP, or you can even use Node.js as well, uh, and to build your, say, RESTful endpoints if you want, or to host your dynamic websites. And the nice thing about App Engine is that, again, there's no infrastructure that you have to manage. Today, you may have one user, you'll automatically just give you one instance to use. In, in fact, it's actually free to use for just one instance. Um, but if tomorrow, like Cloud Spin, like tomorrow, like everybody goes to the mall and take a lot of these uh, photos, then it's going to be able to scale up uh, for you automatically behind the scenes. Uh, in fact, we give you like 28 free instances uh, to use per day. Wait, 28 free instance hours? They're only 24 hours a day. What that means is you can actually burst uh, in a day, like you may have like just one instance most of the time and then you can burst for a couple of hours to two instances and come back down. So that's really, really nice. Um, another thing is like we are you know, planning to distribute this uh, cloud spin to many, many different places. And here we have this, uh, this guy from Texas, I don't know who that is. Uh, basically air guitaring uh, maybe to Aerosmith uh, in, I don't know, in Texas, perhaps. And uh, here's uh, somebody, uh, another crazy person, uh, Kung Fu fighting an Android doll. And I think Android won this round. And then in Japan, this is actually in Japan, uh, where the team uh, in Japan was taking a photo here for their team exercise, right? So there are different times where you know, your, your processor, the processing power that you have, may only be, in, be able to handle like certain amount of traffic normally. But then maybe again on a Sunday, Sunday morning when like parents take their kids to the mall and all of a sudden you have a burst on traffic, you want to be able to absorb that traffic somehow. And the way they were doing it is by you know, putting a message queue in front of our processors. And what that gets us is that when we have like a surge in traffic, like right now we can only handle 100 videos per hour. And later, like there's like 300 videos per hour. Rather than losing those things uh, in like a 404 or like a 500 arrow, we just buffer these messages, buffer these videos and these requests into a message queue, and then we can just process it later as we spin up more and more extractors behind the scenes. Now again, rather than setting up our own 
uh, queues in our own infrastructure to host these queues and uh, or topics uh, or messaging infrastructure. Uh, in cloud, we actually have something called cloud pops up. And that's real nice because you can actually just set up like a queue or a topic uh, by a few, with a few clicks. And then there's, again, behind the scenes, it's going to manage all the infrastructure for you. There's nothing you have to worry about. And it will scale behind the scenes as well because, again, that's what we have been using internally as well. Now, once the messages are being queued up in the very first queue, right, we have all this video that needs to be processed. Now we actually have to kick off the process to do the actual extracting and stitching. And Brett is going to walk us through that process. Cool, yeah, so this is, uh, like Ray said, the extraction and the stitching. These are the, the bits that are actually uh, looking at a video, they're finding the one frame, pulling it out, and then putting it together. So this is, this is the one part where we're sort of writing code in the cloud. Everything else is basically configuration and setup and is managed for us. Um, so, so the extractor is going to take a look at a video. So this is the audio level uh, of a video that's been uploaded. So you can see it's not perfectly silent. There's kind of some background noise. Um, but fundamentally, it's looking for one frame that has a spike in audio. Can anyone see where that is on this graph? Yes, that's right, right here. Um, so it's looking for something, uh, uh, an audio level that spikes. So this is like kind of the silent level, and then this is the beep. So it's looking the frame for the frame that corresponds to the beep. So that's what the extractor uh, is doing. Uh, here's the code. We're using a, uh, a Python library called MoviePy. Uh, our intern, Matt, that didn't plug in the lamp, this was uh, his, his, contri his contribution was the first round of this. So uh, in case you're curious, I won't walk through the code necessarily, but what the algorithm is, it's looking for an audio level that is four times above the average audio level of the entire video. So um, that's how we're determining what that, where that spike is. And once it finds it, um, it looks at the timestamp of where that is, and then it extracts that one frame. So here is one frame again, in case you don't follow. Here's some pictures, this helps me. Um, so each camera, so here's an example of five. Um, five videos that got uploaded and it's pulling one frame out. So now that we have the five frames though, we need, oh whoops, I jumped ahead. Um, so Google Compute Engine is the, our cloud platform's sort of virtual machine offering. So this is, uh, if you actually, if you don't want something that's managed or you have some very special needs where you actually need to have, you know, I want a 16 core CPU Ubuntu box running, you know, 1404 with, uh, uh, with 128 gigs of RAM or whatever. Um, this is our offering in that, in that realm. So you can specify exactly what you need. You can install whatever you want onto it. Um, you know, obviously you're responsible for like doing patching and things, but um, if you have special needs, this is, this is, a, great, uh, this is a great offering. Um, and actually one thing that I'll point out, I'm not gonna get too salesy, but I do like about it in our fake startup world, uh, it has sub hour billing. So a lot of like cloud providers, uh, if you use it for one second of one hour, then you pay for the hour. So in our world, with pulling these videos uh, and extracting one frame, like that only takes a few seconds. So it's kind of annoying that we'd have to pay for a whole hour uh, if we had a virtual machine that only was alive for like uh, a minute. So um, our billing model, uh, in case you're curious, is we charge for the first uh, 10 minutes and then it's just per one per minute after that. So anyway, the interesting thing about um, uh, our compute engine, our virtual machine offering, is it has a feature called auto scaling. So auto scaling, you essentially define what we call like a recipe, a template for your virtual machine. So in this case, it's we want a virtual machine that has you know whatever OS, however many CPUs, um, and it has our uh, extractor software. It's just a Python script, um, but it has our extractor software on it. So we can have uh, auto scaling tied to a bunch of different metrics. So if, for example, you've got a cluster of like, let's say 10 of these, um, once network traffic hits a certain level, uh, it can automatically start adding uh, virtual machines to it. Once CPU load hits a certain level, we can start adding to it. What we could do in our case is, uh, so Ray talked about PubSub as our message queue. We could actually say, how many messages are in this queue? So if a thousand videos come in and our message queue is like, whoa, 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 okay, okay, hold up. Okay, I got these thousand. Uh, we can actually have uh, uh, autoscaler say, oh, crap, we have a thousand requests. Let me spin up literally a thousand virtual machines. So each one would pick up one request, uh, uh, execute it, and be done. Um, and with Cloud Platform, Google Cloud Platform, that uh, spinning up those virtual machines is extremely fast. Um, so a thousand virtual machines is like two to three minutes. So it's, it's really quick, um, which is nice. It's because we plan on getting our fake startup into all kinds of fake blogs and like fake tech crunch, um, and we're gonna be super popular. All right, so the very last step is actually stitching the frames together. So to do that, um, all right, so we are using Firebase here, um, just to kind of explain what's going on. 
as each extraction uh, uh, job is done, it says, okay, I, I just finished frame seven, I'm done. So the stitcher will say, okay, cool, like, do I have all of the frames? Because it doesn't really help me if I have like frame seven and frame 11 and frame three, like, you can't really do much with that. So it's just waiting until I have frames one through 19 all done. And once I have all my frames, then I'm gonna stitch them together. So we store that data in Firebase um, for a couple of reasons. One is easy and it's managed for us. We don't have to stand up anything. Um, it also pushes out real-time updates to our visualizer. You can see there's like this pink looking thing down there um, that will show us the status, the status uh, of every frame as it's going through this process. So once we have every frame uh, extracted, then our stitcher is gonna say, cool, I'm gonna go to this temporary storage where we have each individual frame and I'm gonna stitch them together into this animated GIF. Woohoo! All right, so let's take a look at the demo. Um, I have a video of it in action, but let me ask you a question. Who here has done live demo, live coding demo, something like that? Yes. Uh, how many of you have had that go horribly wrong? Yes, it's same number of hands. Um, so we thought, it's not that fun to just have a demo fail. Why don't we make it even harder? So we're actually gonna do a live demo, remote, off-site, all the way downstairs uh, in our live rig. So let's, let's take a look at that. Live demo time, because normal demos are just not scary enough. So I'm gonna call, I don't know if you noticed, he's basically like, was a magician, but Ray has, Ray has vanished. And um, our lovely assistant has made him reappear downstairs. So let me call him, get him on video chat here. <clears throat> and we will walk you through, make sure you can see my smiling face. All right. Yes, Ray, you look suspiciously like a, a pug. I don't know what that was. <laughs> hey, Ray, all right, wave, wave to everyone. <laughs> Hi, Ray, all right. So Ray is gonna walk us through this rig. So if he spins around, oh, and that is Frank. Uh, we got some like Wi-Fi lag. So Frank is our model. He is uh, picking up some toys. So Ray is walking around the rig. You can kind of see this ring of Android phones. Um, you can see they're all green. So that means they're ready to, to record. So he is going to show, he's gonna go to B, who's managing our control tablet. Oh, oh, there's Frank. Yeah, the Wi-Fi is kind of laggy, so I'll just narrate to whatever Ray's doing. So we just practice jumping. So Frank was just jumping up in the air. I think that was a practice one. So now he's gonna show the control tablet, which, so the, the cameras are all green. And when the countdown, see it's going yellow, so that means it's getting ready. Now they go blue, that means they're recording video. And then he's gonna jump, hooray! Uh, and then B probably hit take video while he was up in the air. So we're gonna go take a look at our visualizer TV, which is down there. Um, and then actually, I'm gonna try and pull this up on my screen. So actually, all right, so you can see they all say uploading. So Firebase is uh, reporting the, stat the status very quickly that each phone is uploading. So we're gonna pray to the Wi-Fi gods. All right, so you can see the little spinner. That means it's finished uploading and it's starting to extract the frame. Um, and Ah, yeah, so we're starting to get frames, so... And you can see, because we spun up an extractor for each frame, they all finish at different times. And that's why we had to have Firebase to kind of coordinate that all, so that since they're all finishing at different times, once they're done, uh, it'll, once they're all done, they'll know. So, you can see a lot of them are still uploading. This is like, welcome to conference Wi-Fi. All right, three. Come on, little guy. Oh, man. This is taking forever. Let me... Uh, yeah, our live, our live visualizer downstairs showing the same thing. Uh-huh. Uploading, uploading. Any questions? Yes. Uh, who is actually doing the audio part? Is it manual? Yes. So we have, um, we looked into it a little bit. The problem is you people do crazy things, and it's like hard to know like what is the right. So some people like dive forward. So we thought, like, actually, why don't we find like the highest moment? Because for a lot of the times, that would actually be the, 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 Find the frames where there's something happening at the highest point, uh, right? So if I'm jumping or I'm throwing something in the air, find that top frame. But some, pe some people wanted to like jump sideways or they're like high-fiving or they're like doing a karate kick or whatever. And so we did it manually. Well, A, we had three weeks, so that was like the easiest. Um, but then also just because people are doing like crazy things. So, um, so we, we have someone down there who literally is like pressing that button and then uh, at the right time. Or maybe not at the right time. All right, so now they're all processing. We're getting somewhere. Any other questions I can answer while I'm uh, tab dancing? Uh, don't any jokes? Yeah. So it looked like in the audio spike there were two frames that were being picked up. Uh -huh. It didn't see an algorithm like if you're doing something to pick between 
Uh, it'll typically just pick the first one, yeah. And we'll, we'll probably improve that algorithm, because as we take it around, we see that like, sometimes it, it goofs up. Um, but right now, it'll just pick the first one. All right, hooray, and now it has rendered our 3D video. Yay, it worked. Well, I thought it was cool. <laughs> um, awesome, so this is, this is Frank. Uh, Frank is actually on the Firebase team. So please talk to Frank. Um, he's hilarious, and he will tell you more than you ever want to know about Firebase. Uh, in fact, anyone on the yellow, with a yellow Firebase shirt can help you out. Um, all right, so just to reiterate, three weeks from pretty much from start to finish. Um, and we used a lot of the cloud stuff because we wanted to spend almost as much time as possible writing code or solving like sort of hardware problems, like what kind of tripod to use and like what kind of phones to use. So we did not want to have to mess with oh my god, like how many cores do I need for this? Or uh, how do I monitor my Hadoop cluster to know if it goes down, right? Like we want these services. Ta-da! The man of the hour, yes, Ray's back. Um, so we wanted this all managed for us. And so this really focused, let us focus on coding. And you guys are at DroidCon, so that means we spent a huge amount of our time working on with this little green guy here, uh, which is what you want to do. Like that's, that's the idea. You don't want to have to manage your infrastructure and your back end. Um, all right, so if you want to know more, come talk to us. Uh, Firebase is a whole team. You can talk to us about Firebase or those guys down there. Other stuff that we kind of have in Cloud Platform that we didn't really get into, containers, Kubernetes, big data, big query. If you have questions about any of that stuff, um, please find us. We're downstairs. We're at that giant contraption uh, or come up afterwards. All right, thanks.